been employed there for approximately 13 years. Um, I had a great passion for the feral cats. Um, and a lot of that comes from, I started as an animal care tech. I did that for about a couple of years. And then I was working in animal intake for approximately eight years. And every time we got in a feral cat, we euthanized it. Healthy, beautiful cats. Why? There was no reason for us to be doing that. So we decided to look into this further. And since, like Tanya said, we started having all these new programs, I approached her and asked her if we could give this program a shot. Um, we put the program together. I had some help from another gal at the shelter. And then we presented the program to Tanya, and she said, let's go for it. So here we are today. This is my fourth year doing this program at the shelter. And it's done a lot of good. We, we have, you know, here you're going to have to walk. I'm not done this before, so I apologize if I'm a little nervous. <laughs> we don't care. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so some of the feral roots, there's a lot of misconception. You know, when you're out there and you're working with people, you sometimes get those lost and abandoned cats mixed in with your feral cats. And it's important that you kind of know some of those differences of what you need to look for. Um, the feral cats are going to have little to no contact with humans. And a lot of them, if they do have the human contact, it's been started as an adult or a six-month-old kitten. And it's typically just with that particular person that is feeding them on a regular basis. They're not socialized to humans at all. And by that time, they don't want any of us anyway, just somebody to put some food outside and to help us make it through the winter with some shelters. Um, they're not fit for living indoors as pets. It would be horrible. I know of some people who think that some of these adult cats, I feel sorry for them, and they should be brought in and live indoors. No, it is so inhumane to do that to these cats. These cats are outdoors. They are their survivalist boy. I've seen everything. And that's where they belong. They don't belong in my house hiding underneath the bed or up in the rafters in your basement. Okay? And the females, yeah, they spend most of their time pregnant and starving outside. That's why we want to get these guys sterilized. And then fighting the disease spread is most commonly a result of the male cats looking for mates. And those guys can actually travel up to a mile radius looking for a mate. So if you are taking care of a colony and your male is missing for a month, that's what he's doing, most likely. Um, the feral cats, like we just talked about, they don't approach the humans. The majority of them do not talk. Some of your kittens will meow when they're really stressed out to because they're looking for their mother um, if you have them in a trap and most of the time you'll see them at night my colony that I take care of is out all day long now they're all sterilized and it's just going to depend on the area and how managed the colony is and when that person comes to feed them whether they're in the early mornings or in the late evening when they are out and about um, and typically, yes, most of them won't eat until you leave. They will stay back a little ways from you. And then once you walk just a couple of steps off, they're right there in their food. And the strays, of course, they approach people and food. A lot of them will talk and meow at you. Now, depending on how long the stray cat has been out and about, if it's been six months, if it's been a year, if it's been a year and a half, it's got some of those traits because it's had to learn to survive outdoors. It's kind of hard sometimes to be able to tell the difference between the two of them, and especially when you first trap feral cats or even a stray cat, you cannot judge them. And it's really important that you do not judge them. We just upheavaled their whole life. We took them from the outdoors. They're in this cage. They can't get out. So it's not fair to make a judgment call on them that first day. I will typically, for the stray cats, let them at least sit overnight. I probably will just get them sterilized too because that makes a difference too. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna see what am I getting from this cat. Is it actually a feral cat or is it a stray cat that needs to stay and have somebody work with it to, so that it can actually trust humans again. Here's the basic principles of the TNR program, first to trap the feral cats we humanely trap in live traps. We neuter, we sterilize, we ear tip every single cat, and I will not take an argument from anybody. If you're going to go through my TNR program and these cats are going to be specifically put back outdoors, it has to have an ear tip. 
I don't want somebody else going into that specific area, trapping those cats and that you're not tipped. If you're there trapping, it's telling you, if it, especially if it goes in, which typically they won't, um, you will know that it's been sterilized and you can actually just let it go. Um, and we also give our rabies vaccination to every single cat that is just part of the program. Um, and then typically I will have everybody stay overnight. That's another specific thing that I have everybody, they have, the cats have to stay overnight. I want to make sure that they are awake and that they are back to their normal self so that you can take them back and let them go outside. If it's 20 degrees below, you know, we're doing zero, something like that, I might let somebody keep them an extra day, especially if it's a female. But typically, the longer you keep them in that environment, the more stressful it is for these guys, and we typically will set off an upper respiratory infection, something that they are actually carrying, but they are a good carrier with that, and they can defend those off until we actually stress them out. So this is this was us a while back. Like in many shelters, we used to accept the feral cats for euthanasia. We stopped the acceptance of feral cats in 2008. We had a lot of disagreements about this with the staff, um, with some of the management. They couldn't understand how we could turn people away. Well, my philosophy was, how can I take these cats and euthanize them when I'm running the trap neuter return program and I want them put back outside? And so we had a lot of issues with that. We finally worked through it. If you come in and you have a feral cat in a live trap, we have trained our intake staff. You have to talk to people just a certain way. You have to offer to them, hey, we'll sterilize this cat for you. And then you can pick it up tomorrow and just take it back and let it go outside. Typically you're gonna get, do I have to pay for that? And you're going to say, no, this is a free service. Just please take the cat back and put it back outside where you found it. And we've not had too many problems. Have we had a couple people not show up to pick them up? <coughs> yeah, we have. And that's why we have the barn program. So we had another option for them. We don't always have an option for them, but we try to have that other option. And are you going to have some people who are going to pain, be a pain in your butt? Yes, you are. Will they argue? Yes, they're going to argue. You have to stand your ground, and typically we've just told people, well, then you're just going to have to take the cat back, and you're going to get, well, I'm going to take down the road and drown it. They will say anything to you to get you to take that feral cat. And it's all in how you talk with people and how you approach them, which will make that difference of you not having to take that feral cat with the exception of getting it sterilized. Yeah? Do you, when, when you um, ask the people just to put it back, you know, take it back, do you ask them to feed it or? Typically what's happened is somebody is already feeding that cat around that area. I have only come across two places that nobody was actually feeding the cats. They were throwing garbage out but not specifically feeding them cat food. Mm -hmm. And these people who are bringing you those feral cats are typically the neighbor who's really angry about that cat, because these guys can be a nuisance problem. That is something that, that's the conversation that you have to have with this person. Well, you know, I'm betting one of your neighbors is feeding this colony of cats. And I don't want you to be responsible for feeding the cat. I want you to just help us by letting us sterilize it for you. We will vaccinate it for you too. Just pick it up the following day, take it back where you found it and let it go. And after time, what happens is most people don't show up anymore. You won't have those feral cats coming into the shelter. We have hardly anybody anymore, maybe one or two. But what happens is the intake is very conscious of this program, and they talk these people into letting us sterilize them. And they return and take them back. And like I said, the few that we didn't have picked up, we fortunately started the barn program, and those guys were placed in somebody's barn. So. In 2007, see, we accepted 1,200 feral cats for euthanasia. It's crazy. These cats are absolutely healthy, beautiful cats. There's nothing wrong with them except for they don't like any of us. So, you know, it was not a fair deal for these guys at all. Our numbers started going down. We started, we accepted 500, and in 2009 we had two. That's what makes the difference. 
And since 2007, in this program, I have helped people sterilize 4,000 feral cats. It's amazing. It really is. So euthanasia of the healthy animals, when we stopped euthanizing these guys, I mean, the humane standpoint, it, it is so important. I don't know if any of you have had any, you know, out and about experience with talking with other people like the neighbor who hates the cats or the person who's actually feeding the colony of cats. But if you're an animal control and you have shown up to track these cats, which, which happens from somebody calling them? They will tell that person that I'm taking it to the Humane Society is going up for adoption. What? And these people have no idea. They are totally uneducated about that issue. I can't put a feral cat up for adoption. And it's so unfair to be lying to these people that that's actually what we're doing. We ended up calling, we have critter control in, I think it's critter, critter getters? Something like that. That's what we have around this area. Those guys were actually going around and trapping all the feral cats. And yes, they were bringing t uh, them to us for a short period of time until I started this program and said, I'm not taking these cats from these guys. They're very inhumane. They were riding them in the back of their trucks. They're not covered up in the traps. And they throw them around. They really don't care so much. And it's unfortunate, but I think that they are also in a learning process of being able to change what they are doing too. And hopefully we will be able to help them understand why we're doing this program. And yes, the leading cause of death in, in cats is euthanasia in the shelters. And no one is forcing us to euthanize the feral cats. It's something that we have to change as individuals and as an organization. Education of the community is extremely important. I find that the majority of people are not educated towards this program. If you have to explain this program to somebody who is totally against the cats, once you're done with that conversation, they're going to have a totally different outlook on this whole program of why we are sterilizing these cats, vaccinating them, and then why we are putting them back outside. Also, the other part, big part we had to work on was the education of the staff. They did not think that it was very nice of us to put cats back outside. Why? Well, you have to think about the standpoint of the cats. The cats actually didn't ask to be outside like they are. We're the ones who made that problem. The human population has caused this problem with the cats, the feral cats. So we had to do a lot of work with the staff of educating them as to why we wanted the feral cats sterilized and put back outside. You also have to have quick access, access to TNR for cats that are brought into the shelter, which is like we were just talking about. If somebody shows up in intake with a feral cat in a trap, are you going to take some money from them? No, most likely not. Do you want the cat sterilized or do you want to not sit there and argue with them about money? Well, I want the cat sterilized. You just need to take it and you need to work it out. We have a, a separate room in the new shelter, which is lovely. Um, it's just for feral cats. That's all that goes in there. It's a room, it's right off of the clinic. I have, our doors are right like this, so we, they, they go in, they grab them, and they take them in. That's the kind of access you need to have. You need to be able to take that cat from somebody, put it in that room, let your clinic know, I've got a feral cat so that they can sterilize it. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> sure. Okay. So you get it in right away and do the surgery right away, or do you have to wait a time period, like make sure they're not? sick or if they're sick do you still do it? It depends on the time of day that the cats are dropped off. Um, like like if it's a Friday there are they do sterilize but it's not like my typical schedule that I have people bring in Monday through Thursday. If they don't get to it that day that the cat's in there they will do it the following day. <coughs> um, if somebody shows up on the weekend and they have one an intake will take it because they can set that cat up in this specific room and they will get food and water in the trap all through the weekend. If they have made a mess in the trap, then oh, we just kind of switch it into another trap and put them back on the shelf and in there. So, I mean, it's you've got to have something like that. What about their sick? That's a vet call. Um, in the vet, they look at all the cats. Um, you'd be surprised about some of these guys. I've had some of them with broken legs. Uh, the last one I trapped was at Wendy's. Um, there in Ypsilanti and she had a broken leg. People were calling, calling, calling. Oh my God, this cat's dying, you know? It's hurting all this. Well, you know what? She was running. 
Yeah. <laughs> as soon as she saw all of us come, she was running. She would just run. It, they actually had people there chasing her around a couple days before I got there with nets trying to catch her. And that's not what I want. What I wanted was the way I do my program. You take that food away for a couple of days, you let people know we're coming, we catch her. Well, she, it ended up, it had grown back. That's why she could run. Most of these guys can't do that. They'll have broken legs and things like that. People will call, it's inhumane, they want to trap it. Actually, you should just leave them alone. If that cat can run from you, I say leave him alone. So, but she got adopted. She was actually very friendly, very sweet. I think somebody dumped her there. And um, I think we fixed, I don't know if they amputated her leg or not, but anyway, it got fixed and she got adopted. So, so that all worked out. Here's another thing. This is extremely important. It's to reduce the organizational stress. It was very stressful. I always find it very stressful euthanizing an animal, and even helping. And you know, I was a participant in that for eight years at the shelter. And it's very, very difficult. And you, you, there were days I went home and cried. You know, why did we do this? We're a totally different organization now. I don't have to worry about that. And other times I have to fight for the feral cats. Yeah, I do. Have I had arguments with the vet? Yes, indeed. Um, and, you know, it's important that you reduce that for everybody that is working with the animals at the shelter. I don't care whether it's dogs or cats or the ferals. It's important that that issue is reduced. And the staff, see, we have compassion fatigue. Um, where we have, you know, they don't want to euthanize the healthy feral cats. We, and why should we? You know, there's no reason to euthanize them. And this is an extremely important thing that we have to get this message out to everybody. It does send a confusing message to the public that you will take their companion animals for adoption and their feral cats for euthanasia. And that's very correct. We're going to take one. One for adoption, and we're just going to euthanize the other one just because it's not cuddly and fuzzy and wants to sit on our lap all day long. Well, you know, that's, that's not the right thing to do for these guys. This is the crazy cat. This is me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet I have, I have lots of cats. <laughs> I bet you know, I have easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many of you um, have actually talked with a, an actual caretaker who takes care of eh, maybe 20 cats? Have you? They're interesting people, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they can talk to you for hours on end and tell you a story about every single cat. It's wonderful. Um, it amazes me how important it is to them to take care of each and every one of those feral cats that they have. And that's an important message for us to also get out to the community to support this program. And they have no idea. People think that, oh, that they're just running around wild, nobody's taking care of them, they're all starving. It's not the case anywhere you go. How many of have you found that somebody's not feeding? You never do. You might not know who it is, but somebody's always putting the food source out for these guys. So it's important that we, you know, have the public realize that it's important that we talk about these things um, and what the value is for these cats to be outside. Um, you know, they're not a disposable commodity to be discarded at any time. That's correct. You know, they shouldn't be discarded. Yeah. I find in the TR program we do in our community is that the people that are feeding them are afraid to call us and think we're going to come and trap them and kill them. Yes. So a lot of people who truly are feeding colonies don't want you to know about it. So we have to go in and let them know we're gonna we're doing safe we're gonna do a good thing for you. Right. We're gonna come in, we're gonna trap them, we're gonna feed them, and we're gonna bring them back to you. So I find communities are afraid to even let you know what they're doing. They that people they're doing this. It's a, it's a hush hush. It is. Once you get into it, it's gigantic how many people are doing it. Mm -hmm. And here's my problem. The humane society. You're not gonna trap and steal like me. You're gonna kill it. And I mean seriously. Everywhere I go. And are they this is their thought process from eight to ten years ago from our shelter. And I understand why, because that's what we were doing. It's been very hard and it takes me a lot of education to let people know that no, this is not what we're doing. I do not want you to, you know, think that I'm going to trap them and kill them all. 
I had a issue in a trailer park that I did. I trapped and sterilized 185 cats in there. And I had one specific gal, she went outside and she took them all in her trailer because she thought I was gonna trap them and take them to the shelter and have them all euthanized. So what I did is, I, I thought she was gonna punch my lights out too a couple of times. <laughs> People will get in your face sometimes and that's, you know, you have to, you have to stay calm and you have to listen to what they have to say because, you know, they have, they have the right to tell you things too, you know. What I did with this gal was I went and knocked on the door and I said, look, I have my whole van full of feral cats from your trailer park. I'll be back here tomorrow. I want you to meet me up and I told her the lot number. I'll be there tomorrow at a specific time and I want you to watch me let them all go. Was she there? Oh yeah, she was. She watched me let all of those cats go. Then I was able to go down on her property and help her get her cat sterilized. But that's, that's what happens. And that's why it's important to get that word out that, no, this is what we are doing and this is why we are doing it. We do not want to euthanize the cats. We want to stop the population issues. Yes, we have to keep us mission focused. I want to be out of the nuisance business, and that's what people think that feral cats are, you know? And if we go in, we trap them, we sterilize them, we vaccinate them, we educate our caretaker. That's another really important part of this program. A lot of them, they leave plates all over the ground, they leave food laying all over the place, they feed at the wrong times of day, so you got skunks, raccoons, and possums. The possums really like to fight for the food, too. And those are things that are really important that we educate those people on not to do. You have to feed at a specific time. You don't want those wildlife issues there because those neighbors that are around there, that's what, that's what makes them angry. And the trash, things blowing around. Just once you've gone in and you've educated this caretaker, you've had them clean up the colony, you take the cats back, they're never going to know because they won't see the cats anymore. And they won't be out there spraying, they won't be out there screaming and yelling, and with all their mating issues, it takes care of all of those issues. So, keep going. <laughs> I have seen this. Oh my goodness, is he huge? <laughs> I, I have a question. Would, do you have like an educational packet that you hand out to people who manage colonies? Um, or like the, like the trailer park lady where she can identify new ones coming? You know. No, I do not. And the reason I don't is because what has happened is I find that the more face-to-face -face conversation I have, the better off I am. If I just have that one conversation with that one individual, you know what usually happened? This is how this happened with me. It went from that person to that person to that person to that person. It was just all word of mouth. And then all of a sudden I was pulling my hair out because I had all these people wanting help for TNR, and it's, keep, it's growing on a regular basis. But I find that one-on-one -on -one contact is a lot better. If somebody wants information, it is on our website about the TNR program. It tells you how to tell the difference between a stray and a feral cat. So some of that information is on there. And if for anybody here, if you have anything that you wanted to ask me after we're done with all of this, or or you're more interested in finding out what we do with our program, our forms and things like that, you're more than welcome to email me and you're more than welcome to call me. It might take a couple of days to get back with you, but I always get back with everybody.